Isn't our God great this morning? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. This new suit needs to that. I've had a long week. I've got two newborns in my house. I'm just tired. All right. This song is a new song. Uh, we don't have words for you this morning, but if you listen to Kayla, you hear. And we really love this song. It really speaks about, you know, breaking into new things. And really, you know, no matter what our battle is or what is going on in our lives under circumstance, you know, we can always hold on to the truth, which is Jesus. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And when we hold on to him, in the bridge, the song talks about, you know, it's a new horizon because I'm set on you. And you meet me here today with the verses that are new. So no matter what's going on this morning, you know, he is our hope.
glad you came this morning. Real quick, um, I just want to say it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Good to have you with us. I uh, know we got several out this morning due to sickness. And I thought vacations ended, but I guess this weekend, right? This is the last vacation weekend of the year. Is that true? No, we got some people traveling, but we thank God that you're here this morning, and we're glad to have you. Glad to have uh, the internet back up and rolling this morning as well, and being able to get our live stream audience on with us today. So we welcome them this morning as well. And uh, we're just thankful to be a part of what God is doing here at Transformation Church. What a wonderful Sunday we had last week, and uh, how God moved. But you know, I've learned you can't you can't get stuck. Amen. Uh, sometimes we come in this morning and we say, "Man, I hope it's like last week again." I don't. Amen. Because God never performed a miracle the same way twice. Right. And so I'm looking for something fresh and new this morning, a new miracle from heaven. Amen. And so this morning it is good to be here. It's good to have you. And so this morning, let's jump right into the Word of God and uh, let's get some help this morning. You know, everything in, in existence, basically, uh, other than God, everything has a point where the pressure of resistance becomes too much and that thing snaps or breaks. Would you agree? In other words, the toughest tree. Let a great storm comes through. There's hurricanes possibly coming through the East Coast this week. You know, you, you let a storm come through and the toughest tree that has stood for 100 years with the greatest resistance, more resistance than it can take, it'll snap and it'll break. You let the toughest tree, the strongest steel, even the hardest human, I've seen when the resistance gets so much, they break. We all have different breaking points. Every substance, every person has a different breaking point in their life. For some, it's the family. In other words, you mess with my family, I'll break. I'll snap on you, I'll lose it, I'll go crazy. You know, don't mess with my family. You can mess with me, you can mess with my job, you can mess with everything. Don't mess with my family. For others, it's their finances. Let them get in financial situations. You find there's people that actually are committing suicide because of financial ruin. They, they end up taking their own life. You find with others, it's faith. You let somebody do something and say something against God, say something against the church, come in here this morning and the church be all graffitied up, they'd lose it. Amen? Um, and, and we find that even Jesus, if you want to be honest, had a breaking point when it came to faith because he went to the house of prayer and they had turned it into a den of thieves and he righteously lost it for a minute, grabbed the whip, and got to chasing people. Amen? So so everybody and everything has a breaking point is my point this morning. And our biggest breaking point usually doesn't come in an instant. It usually doesn't happen just like that, if we're honest. It happens over a series of time. I've told people that uh, I've learned. This is what I've learned. People come to me for counseling sometimes because they're on the brink of divorce. And I'm thankful that God can restore anything if you let it. But the truth of the matter is, the person that said, I want the divorce, they was out of the relationship six months ago. Amen? You just didn't know. It. But they had already checked out way before they talked to you about checking out. And the reason I say that is because it happens over time. It didn't just, they didn't wake up one day and say, I want a divorce. They woke up over time and said, I'm tired of this, I'm tired of whatever. And in their mind, they wanted to change, and so they come up with a divorce. And it's the same way with everything, same way with church. Very seldom have I seen people leave church in an instant. Amen. It's over time. They, they debate it. They talk about it. They contemplate it. And over time, they get to the place where they're ready to walk away because they've reached their breaking point. Amen. Now, some of the Bible's most influential people, because I know some of you are sitting here and saying, I would never recognize that I have a breaking point. But some of the Bible's most influential people came to the breaking point. Think about this. Moses snapped and hit the rock three times when he should have spoke to the rock because of people's rebellious attitudes. Moses reached his breaking point. We find that Elijah snapped and reached his breaking point and ran away from a great victorious battle scene under a juniper tree and said, God, let me die. We find that David snapped, reached his breaking point, committed adultery with Bathsheba, and then wanted to have her husband killed. He reached a point where giving in to temptation and weakness broke him and he couldn't handle it anymore. There's many others I could go to this morning, but I want to go to one that I relate to very well. But before I do, I want to illustrate. So um, Peyton and, and Reagan, come here. I know there's a reason you're up here this morning, and it's for this. <coughs> How many of you know a rubber band has a breaking point? Amen? Amen. I want you to grab one side. 
side. I want you to grab the other side. And I want you just to keep walking away from each other until it breaks. It didn't break. Don't let it go. Just keep walking. Keep walking. Why are you scared? Because it's going to hurt. You ain't got to do it. It's going to hurt. And you know why the reason we don't want to talk about breaking points is because it usually hurts. We usually don't want to go through the pain of dealing with the places in our life where we've been broken. But I hope you'll understand that your brokenness is helpful to other people. But what causes us sometimes to break? I'm not saying all the time, but I think in this scenario, in this person's life, I believe we can see an illustration that we can relate to because this is something that we find, or I find, that if I'm not careful, if I, if I follow this person's pattern and their steps, I will too end up in a place where it's easy for me to snap, easy for me to break. Now listen to me. The Bible says humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. It's good to be broken if you break yourself. There's one thing you don't want to pray. This is cherry. This is a big cherry on top of your, your banana split this morning. Amen. This cherry is here to tell you, do not ever pray for God to humble you. Never. There's some things you just don't pray for. Don't pray for patience. I've been there, done that. Do not do that. All right? And do not pray for God to humble you. He never says pray that I humble you. He says humble yourself. Because if God humbles you, that means you're going to go through some real stuff for you to get brought to the place my mama used to tell me, boy, you're getting too big for your britches. Amen? Uh, and, and, and so we don't want to get too big for our britches and get God to say, hey, God, bring me back down to size. Now, God, let me learn what size I'm in and let me find it and fit it. Amen? That's where you want to be. But this morning, if I could, I want you to look at uh, Luke 22, verse 31 through 34. And they help us pray that our screens and things get fixed pretty soon. We had that lightning strike last week and we've lost some stuff, but God's working it. The Bible says, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, that your faith doesn't fail or fails not. And when you are converted, strengthen your brother. And Simon says to the Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus says, I tell you, Peter, the rooster or the cock shall not crow this day before you shall deny me three times that you even know me. Now, we all know this scripture if we've been in church any time at all. But this morning, I want to take Peter and use him as my example because I find with Peter there's some very important things that we need to understand. And the first thing you need to understand, if you were going back and looking at this text in the beginning of this text, you would find in Luke 22 that it is the Passover. Jesus has desired to have the Passover with his disciples. There's a great upper room that has been furnished, and they are there, and they're sitting at the table when this discussion happens. You've got to get that in your mind. Amen? Now, the problem is, is that we've been mis, uh, mistaught about this table because we go by, by what we know and by what we've been taught. And if you go by Da Vinci's painting of the Lord's Supper, then the table is straight across. Uh, like your view would be straight across and everybody's sitting there and Jesus is in the middle, but that is not true. If you go and learn Jewish culture, and, and I learned this recently, if you learn Jewish culture and you were to go to Israel, they, the true people of God, the Hebrews, would tell you that that's not the way those tables would have been set up. It would have actually been what's called a triclinium. It would have been a three-sided table that would have been set up. So if I can, I need four more volunteers real quick, four guys. Four men, stand up, man. Let's go. Come on, four men. We'll get out of here at 11 or 1. It doesn't make a difference. Hey, man, come with me. Come on. That's good. I got four, Don't Thank you. Dylan, I'm going to get your name right before the end of the day. Hey, man. So what we're going to do, you guys, come over here. You just stay over there, brother. I'll let you stay where you're at. And then Dudley, you come over here and just get beside Jerry. That'll work. Okay, scoop down just a little bit where you're even with, with Dudley. <laughs> It's all right. You say that. Thank you. <laughs> so this is the thing. I want you to understand this. So here's the way the table would have been set up. I'm up here in the middle. Amen. I, I'm up here at the front of the table. The ends go out. Realize it would have been a short table. They would have been sitting on the floor on pillows. They would have reclined back on their left arm, on their elbow, and they would have eaten with their right hand. 
This is all very important because what we find is at this table, Jesus had already assigned the seating order because he's the Lord of the table, right? He's the host of the dinner. And so he is the one assigning, and this is Jesus. Jesus is assigning the seating order, amen? Now, what he had assigned was he assigned Peter on this day to sit right here in this seat. This seat on this side of the table at the end would have been the seat of the servant. What that required was, was that anybody that came in was Peter's job to wash their feet because the custom was and still is in Palestine in Jewish tradition in Israel is that the bread was so dusty that when you come into the house, they wash your feet. They don't want the dirt of the world in their house. That's a whole different sermon. Amen. Right. But the thing is, is that Peter's job was to make sure all these men and Jesus feet got washed. Well, we know if you know the story from John 13 of the Last Supper that Jesus ends up getting up from the table girding himself with a towel and washing everybody's feet. When he gets to Peter, he says, Peter, Peter says, Lord, you won't wash my feet. And Jesus says, well, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have no part of me. Right. Amen? And yeah. Peter says, well, wait a minute. If that's the case, then wash my head, wash my hands, wash my feet, wash me all the way, because I want to be in you as much as I can. Amen? But understand, when Peter replies, we look at it like Peter's humble, and he's saying, Lord, I, I don't, you're too great to wash my feet. No, Peter's upset. Because the moment Jesus got up and girded himself, he realized in that moment, Jesus was doing what he failed to do. He should have been serving, but instead of serving, he chose to sit. Now, let me go before I get into the message. On this side, this is his job. John the Beloved. Amen? And John's at the seat of security. John is there to make sure Jesus' food is not contaminated. He's there to make sure that, that Jesus is, is protected because the door would have been over here where anybody would have entered. John is at the seat of security. That's how we know we know this. Because the Bible says John leaned over and laid his head in Jesus' bosom. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> and the only way you can do that if you're laying on your left side and eating with your right hand is to be on Jesus' right. So then you have the seat of honor. It's always here, the second seat up from the end of the table on this side. The seat of honor is here, and Jesus is the honored guest. He is the one, I'm sorry, the seat of the host. He is here, and it's the seat of host. And so he's there, and he's the one hosting this thing. <clears throat> so he sits right here. But then next to him is the seat of honor. This is the most special seat at all the tables. This is the seat where you would want to be sitting. This is most likely the seat that James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were arguing about with their mother. And we sit on his right and his left. They knew on the right was protection and on the left was honor. They said, let me sit somewhere close to Jesus. So who would you imagine is at this seat? The Bible says that Jesus talking in that last supper, he says, the one that I dip the bread with and sop with, that one will betray me. Jesus is eating with his right hand. He would have dipped and handed to his left. Judas was the man on his left. The one he knew that would betray him. The one out of all the disciples he knew that was on his way to hell. He gave the seat of honor. I'm going to take a quick time out and tell you this this morning. The people that should have honor in this church. In this congregation, when they come in that door on Sunday morning, is the one closest to hell every Sunday. Not me. Not me. Not your pastor. It should be the one that's closest to hell. You should love them like you love nobody else. You should give them the place right. You should say, preacher, let me slot over and give them my seat this Sunday. Let me park at the end of the room so they can have my parking spot because I want them to know Jesus. Isn't it amazing that even though he was there, he still betrayed the Lord. But this is my point. Let me get back in my sermon. This morning, Peter's over here, and his job was to serve. And instead of serving, he chose to sit. And this is the beginning, the beginning of Peter's breaking point. Because what we find is the moment he sees Jesus get up, something stirs in him. And he says, Lord, you're not washing my feet. That would have been more of the approach. Because he's so frustrated at the fact that that Jesus is doing what he failed to do. That he says, no, man, this ain't happening. And Jesus says, well, if I don't wash your feet, because he knows his heart. 
He knows he's upset. He knows he's frustrated. But in Jesus' mind, he's thinking, all you have to do is do what I ask you to do. Just obey me. And he looks at him and he says, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you're not part of me. Didn't say he wasn't saved. He just said, you're not, you're not part of this group today. You're not following me because it's my table. I'm the host. I make the rules and I want your feet washed. And so Peter says, well, Lord, then okay, then wash my head, wash my hands, wash all of me then because I want to have as much part of you as I can. You guys can be seated. Thank you. So this morning, I want to stop there because you have to understand that the first phase of you becoming broken by Satan, for Satan to get an attack on you and break you, because we understand that's what's happening with Peter, because we understand that Peter here is fixing to have a conversation with Christ, and Christ is going to tell him, as we read, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you like wheat. In other words, if you understand the process of wheat, it's very very, very forceful. We learned about it in Ruth. You take that wheat and you crush it and then you throw it up in the air and you let the wind blow away the fake stuff and the real stuff falls back down and it's a constant process of, of grinding and throwing and breaking and we find that that's what Jesus is telling Peter. He says, Peter, Satan wants to break you, boy. And it all starts here. Had Peter done his job, had Peter served the disciples like he should have, but you got to understand, just, just chapters before this incident, Jesus is there and he says, who do men say that I am? And the disciples say, well, some say you're Elijah, and some say you're John, and some say this, and he says, but who do you say I am? And Peter speaks up and has a moment of revelation. And Peter says, Lord, you are the son of David, you're the Messiah, and you're the king of glory, you're the son of God. And Jesus says, Peter, flesh and blood could have never taught you this. The only way you know this is by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. So you've got to realize Peter's thinking pretty good of himself at this point. But here he's failed. It's not about what he knew. It's what he did with what he knew. And Jesus said, you knew me back there, Peter, but here you don't know me enough and you don't love me enough to serve me and do what I told you to do. You see, your problem is this morning, church, so many times we come into church and we get comfortable and we sit on the pew. And I'm going to tell you something. Phil, football season's kicking off today. Desmond and Jamie's ready. Amen. Uh, they're ready for it. And so it's kicking off today. And the thing is, I can tell you this, not a person on that team is getting paid to do nothing but sit. They're there and they might not play today, but I promise you if people start going out of the game, they're going to be brought in the game. That's why they train. That's why they're there. That's why they're on the team. They're, they they going to call me to pay me millions of dollars to sit on the bench. Thousands. They won't pay me a thousand dollars to sit on the bench because I'm not qualified to do the job. Peter was qualified to do the job, and the thing God is calling you to serve him in, you're qualified to do it. But the problem is we sit, and that's the first phase of Satan breaking us. The second phase I want you to understand is that he wants to break you. The Bible says he's as a lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. The Bible says here that Jesus told Satan, Satan is desiring to sift you. So not only do we see sitting while you should be serving, but we see sifting by Satan. And we find that Satan wants to sift you. He wants to mess you up. He wants to see what you're made of. He wants to see if you're genuine, if you're the real thing, or if you're fake. That's what Satan wants to see. And the way he's going to do that, he's not going to do that by coming up and saying, hey, excuse me, my name is the devil, and I'm here to see, would you, on this questionnaire, say that you really love Jesus? You know, it would be nice. That's just not the way it works. He's going to come with temptations. He's going to come with trials. He's going to come with tests. He's going to come with tribulations. He's going to come throwing the kitchen sink at you. He's going to come with everything he can to try to break you. And this is the amazing thing. Satan knows your weak points. You see, we like to think, we wonder why Satan doesn't come at me with the things that I'm strong against. In other words, I'll be honest with you. I have no desire to drink. I have no desire to do drugs. I've, I've done that, got the t-shirt, been there, all that, all right? I don't have no desire to go back, no desire to do those things again. Satan knows that, so he doesn't come at me with that. Amen? Because if he does, he knows I'm strong there. I will not break. But if you can find the weak point of a substance, you can break it. You see these strong men that go around and do all these acts for people? You know what I found when they rip a telephone book? They know how to make the telephone book weak to start the rip. I watched it on YouTube. 
<laughs> you say, can you do it? I didn't say that. I just said, I'll watch it. <laughs> Amen? But I found that they know how to hold that book just right so that it becomes weaker and they can start the rip. And once the rip is started, you can keep ripping. In other words, once something has a small point in it that's broken, it'll keep breaking. You let a limb, you let a limb start cracking, and you keep standing on it, walking on it, jumping on it, it's going to break. It's just reality because it's had a weak point. Somewhere in it, it reached a weak point. And this morning, Satan knows your weakest point. He wants to come at you where you're weakest. For some, again, that's your family. So you know what he did? Look at Job. He used Job's wife to attack Job because he knew that why didn't he kill Job's wife? He killed, he killed all of his kids. He killed everybody, but he left his wife because he knew his wife was his weak point. And he knew I, that's my weapon of, of offense. That's the weapon I'm going to use when Job thinks it's all over. He's going to be weak. His kids are dead. He's lost everything, but that's not his weakest point. His weakest point is that woman he loves. And I'm going to get her to come to him and say, Job, just curse God and die. And I'll have it. But you see, Job understood, I can't give in to my weak point. I've got to rest it on Jesus. Peter didn't get that. That's why I can relate to Peter, because I give in too many times. And so we find that not only is he here and he's doing this, but the thing is, is that we find that with Peter, Peter's going to give in because what we find about Peter's life is that Peter is godly and gangster at the same time. I don't know if anybody here is like that. But Peter was here saying, you're Jesus, you're Messiah, you're Lord. I love you, but let a man come to you. I'll cut his ear off and kill him in a heartbeat. Godly and gangster. That's Peter. That's why I relate. Amen. Because one minute I'll be saying, God bless you, and the next minute I'll be saying, I'm going to kill you. Amen? Golly and gangster, I mean, and that's Peter, because here comes Malchus, and Jesus has already forewarned him, he's already told him. And here he comes, and all of a sudden, Peter's there, and he's got his sword out, and he's cutting off his ear. Jesus is like, put up the sword, those that live by the sword, die by the sword, Peter. If I wanted this to be a fight, I would have called 10,000 angels. I don't need your help. Peter's standing there trying to figure all this out. You gotta imagine he's trying to discern what just took place. I mean, I told you I'd fight for you, I told you I'd do this. What he's got to realize is that he's being sifted. He's hitting on his weak points. So we find step number three, swollen with pride, because here we find that, that Jesus looks at him and he says, Peter, do you realize? That before the rooster crows three times in the morning, you'll deny me. But before that, Peter says, Lord, I would go to prison with you. I would die with you. He's swollen with pride. He, he believes he knows better than God. And the thing I find in our life, when Satan has broken me, when he's got to me and really broke me, caused me to snap, caused me to lose it, caused me to just have a moment of a lapse, if you will, of my, 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 my godliness, and go gangster for just a minute. When, when those things have happened, it's because I found I wasn't serving like I should serve. I was sitting around on my hands just thinking God was going to do it all. I didn't have to do anything. I, I didn't realize and I didn't conceive in my mind that Satan knew my weak points. And he was coming after me through the people and the places and the things that made me weakest. I didn't understand that I was even prideful. I thought I was being uh, confident. But in truth, I was being cocky. And God says, I have no room for cockiness among Christianity. Confidence, I want you to have. But cockiness, you can leave at home. And the thing is, is that it's good to be confident. But who are you confident in? That's the question. And Peter here is confident and cocky in himself. If you look at the phrasing, it's almost like what Satan said back in the Old Testament when he said, I will be like the Most High. I will, I will, I will. Peter says, I will. Go to prison with you. I will die for you. I will. He didn't say if you allow me to, if you give me the strength to, if you give me the, the, the fortitude to, if you give me the knowledge to. He says, no, me, 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 me. When you start talking about you all the time, I can take your pride. And pride comes before the fall. And we find with Peter here that 
he is very proud. He says, I will go to prison with you. I will die with you. You can't tell me any different, Lord. I know what I'm talking about. But Jesus looks at him and he says, Peter, notice he changed his name. He'd been called him Simon. Now he says, Peter. He says, Peter, listen. Before that rooster crows in the morning, you will have already denied me three times, saying you don't even know me. Now, I know we like to pick up our rocks and throw them at Peter and say, Peter, you're, why would you do that? But we do it too. We do it too. Let's be honest with ourselves this morning. How many times do we deny the Lord in a year's time, in a day's time, in a month's time? We have the devil come at us with our weak spot. And we say, well, I don't know Jesus right now. I'm going to step out of my Christianity into my flesh and do my thing my way for a little bit. And then when it's convenient, I'll come back to Jesus. But right now, I want to be carnal and not Christian. And so many times that's what we do. And we find ourselves battling that dilemma on a daily basis. Paul even said he battled He said, the things that I wish I'd do, I do not. And the things that I shouldn't do, I find myself doing. He said, I'm in this constant warfare between the spirit and the flesh. And I wish to God I could do the things that God would have me to do. And we find this morning that here he is. And he's, he's in this predicament. He's in this situation Peter is. And we find that he's there. And he's swollen with pride. As a matter of fact, Paul had to deal with this. The Bible says that Paul dealt with a thorn in the flesh. In 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10, that Paul was there and the Bible said that God allowed the messenger of Satan to come and buffet him, that he wouldn't be swollen up, basically. Because Paul had just got finished talking about how that he's a Pharisee of Pharisees and he knows all these laws and he's, he's a religious man and he loves Jesus. And if anybody has the right to claim superiority, it's got to be him. And God says, no, 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 wait a minute, you're getting too high-minded. I need you to realize you need me more than I need you. This morning, guess what I had to realize? I had to realize God doesn't have to have Jody. He can use some other person to do what I'm doing, but I can't do anything without God. I need him like I need my more than I need my next breath. And so this morning, you can't allow yourself to become prideful. You can't allow yourself. Matter of fact, James 4 and 10 says, Humble yourselves at the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Psalm 51, 15 through 17, O Lord, open, your, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you desire not sacrifice, else would I give it. You delight not in burnt offering. Listen to verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh, God, that you will not despise. In other words, God says, don't be prideful, be humble. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Be broken yourself so Satan can't break you. It sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? I didn't say I was a moron. I said it sounded like an oxymoron, doesn't it? <laughs> it sounds like one of those phrases that doesn't make sense. It contradicts each other. But what he's saying is if you'll break yourself, <clears throat> Satan can't break you. Have you ever thought about it that way? If I humble myself to the Lord, then I'm so little Satan ain't breaking me. He, he's looking at me. He wants to break me, but he can't get to me to break me because I'm humble. And when he gets to me is when I'm weak. When he gets to me, think about this. If I'm serving, Satan can't keep up with me. He's like, well, wait a minute. Jody's over here. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a minute. He went over here now, and now he's serving. Now he's over there serving. I can't keep up with where he's at. But if I'm sitting, he knows exactly where my location is. He knows exactly where I'm at. He knows where I'm going to be today, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, because I'm just hanging out sulking. He knew where to find Elijah up under a juniper tree. <coughs> But he couldn't stop Elijah when Elijah humbled himself and said, Lord, I need you to send fire. I can't do this. Would you send some fire down and burn up this altar? He couldn't handle that. But the moment he got sulky and sat down, quit serving, he knew where to find him. He knew where to find Peter at that table and he found him. And then he says, I'm going to send you a sweet. And so he finds him and he says, you know how I'm going to do it? Because you're private. Think about this. I believe Satan stood back in the corner and he said, yeah, you're just like me. Thank you, you don't need Jesus. I got you. And that's exactly what we do, church, when we 
decide I can do this. I got this. I don't need you. I, you, you don't need to tell me nothing. I know how to do this, Lord. I've been in church my whole life. I was born on the church. My mom had me right here on the pew. I know what I'm talking about. I know how to live life. I know how to be a Christian. I know how to fight against the devil. I, I've learned it all, Lord. I don't need, I've reached my place. I don't need you. And in that moment, you better realize you're about to be broken. And it's not a good breaking. It's the breaking that Satan is coming against you with. And when he breaks you, he's trying to destroy you. He's trying to get you completely away from God. He doesn't want you living for God. He doesn't want you thinking about God. He doesn't want you turning to God. And so we find with Peter, he's there, and he's fighting, and he's fighting a fight. And the problem is, he's fighting a fight that he doesn't understand because he's fighting a fight in the flesh physically when he should have been fighting spiritually. You see, our problem is we try to fight the devil physically. You can't fight a spiritual power physically. It's impossible. That's why we have to rely on God. Because if you try to fight him physically, you're going to lose every single time. You're going to be swinging and he's not even there. You can't even see him. It's like fighting a ghost. You can't fight something you can't see. But if you understand spiritually how to fight, it's like being in the dark and putting on night vision goggles. Now I have a chance of fighting you. Because I got a vision that they can see in the dark. You have to be able to see in the dark what the devil's doing because he works in darkness. Amen? So you got to put on some Holy Ghost uh, night vision goggles that will illuminate what's around you. And that's the Word of God. And once you get that illumination, now the devil's in trouble because now you can see. Yeah. And now you know he's over here trying to fight you. And so you have to be able to fight back in the way that God's given you to fight. Ephesians chapter number 6. The weapons of a warfare. Amen? The armor of God. you got to be able to fight through those things. Because you're not fighting, the Bible says, against flesh and blood, but against spiritual principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness in high places. That's what you're fighting against. But, but talking about how we can't be prideful, we have to understand that because Peter went through with what he said. But then the moment the Lord reprimanded him and rebuked him, he's all confused now. When all he had to do was listen. But he's all confused. And now he went from sitting to being sifted. He's been thrown up in the air at the table. And he come back down and he said, Ooh, that wasn't real. If I love Jesus, I'll conserve him. Now his heart's hurting. So then he goes out and the Bible says that Jesus looks at him and he says, Hey, I'm going to just go by a rock throw over here and pray. And you got to stay here and pray. Lest you enter into temptation. Now we find him sleeping. Went from sitting to sleeping. Do you know that's what will happen? It'll happen to me if I'm not careful after a while. I'll be watching the ball game, and I'll be tired, and I'll be sitting there, and before you know it, I'll be in a comfortable sitting. <laughs> Amen. I'll be sleeping. And that's what happens to us. We get old. Satan will come and lull you to sleep. He will sing you a lullaby to get you to go to sleep on Jesus. Because he knows if you're not sleeping, you're going to be praying. You're going to be seeking. And so he said, I don't want you seeking. I want you sleeping and sitting. And so he'll just make you comfortable, make you at peace. See, it ain't always about him making things go crazy. Sometimes he'll make things go so good, you'll just get comfortable. And then you'll be there and you'll be sleeping. And the next thing you know, Jesus is coming to you saying, it's time. And you get up and you draw your sword. And you're trying to fight physical when Jesus says, put away the sword. This is spiritual. It's not Malchus you're fighting. It's not the Roman guard. It's not the Jewish Sanhedrin. It is Satan that you're against. And you don't even see it, Peter. So Peter follows Jesus from afar and he walks with him and he's going down to Pilate's hall and he's standing outside where he can hear but he, but he can't see and he's warming himself by the enemy's fire. Do you see that? The enemy of Jesus is standing here with the fire and there's Peter hanging out with the enemy, warming himself by their fire. We find that all of a sudden, on three occasions, three different people look at him and say, Hey, no, you was the one. Yeah, you talk like him. You look like him. You, you hang out with him. We know it's you. You're the guy. You're Peter. You're the fisherman. Left your whole business. And Peter says, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm not him. I don't even know that guy. Strike one. Comes again. Strike two. Third time. It's a little girl. He'll fight a man. But look at this, Satan is sleight of hand. 
He'll have you watching this over here while he's tricking you over here. He's a master magician. He'll get your focus off what you needed on. See, Peter's focus should have been on Jesus and listening to what was going on inside, but now his focus is on the conversation around the fire. His focus should have been on back at the table, remembering Jesus said, you will do this. And instead, he followed through with it instead of making it another story. Amen? And so he's standing here, and as he's standing here, all of a sudden, this little girl looks at him and she says, yeah, I know you. I saw you. I saw you. You was on this hillside with 5,000 giving out bread. I know it was you. You gave me my bread. And Peter says, little girl, shut your bleep, bleep, bleep mouth. Who the bleep do you think you are? So I said, he cussed him. And he said, I don't even know that man. And about that time, he drug Jesus out of the hall. And before Peter can even contemplate what he had done in life, I believe Jesus looked over with eyes of compassion, tears running down his face. He didn't have to say a word. He just kept dragging him with bruises on his face. Where they punched him, mocked him, and Peter runs away. Why? Because he's reached his breaking point. And it came over a series of events, but culminated with a little girl. He was ready for a man. He wasn't ready for a man. You see, you think you've got this figured out, and you think you know. I know where my breaking point is, Pastor. I would never let him reach my breaking point. The problem is that's the problem. Do we are proud? The other problem is a lot of people that I see saying those things are sitting and doing nothing for the cause of Christ. They don't even understand the enemy that they really have. They come to me and say, oh, my wife is my enemy. My children is my enemy. Uh, that person on the job is my enemy. They're atheists. You don't understand what I'm dealing with. I do understand because we have the same enemy. It's not the person on the job. It's not your wife. It's not your kids. It's not your husband. It's not your parents. It's one person. It's called Satan. He's your enemy, and he is out to get you. Now, he will use them if you let him. Amen? But if you understand the enemy, you understand I'm not fighting against people. I'm fighting against a principality and a power, and I've got to fight right. Now, the good news is Jesus looks at him in this conversation, and he says, but don't worry, Peter. Even though you're not praying with me in the garden and you're sleeping, while you're sleeping, I'm giving supplication to the Father for you. And I'm praying for you. If you don't believe me, go read John and find the prayer Jesus prayed in the garden. He says, Lord, all those you've given me, don't let me lose one. Because he knew Peter was one. And he said, don't let me lose one. Because Satan's trying to get him. And I don't want him gone. And so he's praying for Peter. And Peter it doesn't even realize what's going on. And, and he's in a stone's throw. He could have heard everything he prayed, but he doesn't hear it. And so all of a sudden now he's here. And we find that Jesus does strengthen him. You find that Jesus dies. He's resurrected three days later. In John 21, he's by the seashore. And he calls Peter and he says, Peter, do you love me? Three times. One time for every denial. Do you love me? Peter says, Lord, you know I filet of you. He says, no, I'm asking you, you and God may me. He says, Lord, you know I filet of you. I love you like a brother. I don't love you with a sacrificial love because I've denied you three times. See, Peter's still stuck, stuck in where he was and still where God's taking him. And Jesus says, I'm not worried about where you was. Come to where I am. Do you love me with a love that's unending, a love that's sacrificial? And Peter says, no, Lord, I, I don't. I love you with a love that's like a brother, like Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Hey, oh, I love you like that. And, and Jesus, on his third time in the Greek, he says, Peter, do you really believe me? He drops his, his re prerequisite of love. He says, if you can't love me with sacrificial love, do you really love me like a brother then? Peter's heart, the Bible says, his heart is broken. This is a good brokenness. This is the kind of brokenness we need to see ourselves the way God sees us. Not letting Satan destroy us, but let Jesus deliver us Amen. from ourselves. Peter says, Lord, you know all things you know about you. It's just not the love I need to have for you. But notice what he tells Peter every time he asks him the question. Feed my sheep. In other words, get out of the boat, sit in, and go serve me, even if you love me like a brother. Jesus is trying to bring him out of a place 
of being broken anymore from Satan, from being destroyed. And he's bringing him out of that place and he says, get over here because I know what Satan wants to do to you. He wants you to get out of faith. He wants you to get away from me. He's got you back out fishing instead of being faithful. You've seen me. You know I've resurrected. You're still not doing anything. I need you to know I forgive you, man. Let's go. And then at Pentecost, you find Peter getting filled with the Holy Spirit and that love comes and he ends up dying for Jesus in the end. So we find these are your steps that will cause Satan to break you if you're not careful. Number one, you'll be sitting and not serving. What is it the Lord wants you to do? I have people all the time, they say, preacher, I'm too old. Preacher, I'm not quit. Preacher, I, I don't have anything I can do. Preacher, I'm not the person to be on the stage. Preacher, I'm not this. Preacher, I'm not that. All these things. Listen, can I, can I say something without offending anybody? There's a sign up sheet right back there on that desk between this church, sir. Amen? There's parking lot people need to serve. You say, I, I don't want to be seen. There, there's instruments to be played. Serve. There's teaching places to be taught. Serve. I mean, I don't know what God's called you to do, but do it. And do it for the Lord. And you know what Satan begins to do? He says, wait a minute, I went to see Jody, and he wasn't where he normally was. He was gone. What happened? He should be sitting right here sulking, worrying about everything, consumed with worry, consumed with life, but I couldn't find him. Somebody tell me where he's at in his demons report. Well, he's over at the church. At the church. Why is he at the church? I don't need him at the church. Or you know what? He's over visiting somebody in their home, or he's at the hospital, or he's here, or he's there. Why is he doing that? He's preaching a revival. Wait a minute, a revival? We don't need him preaching a revival. You know what that'll do to him? He's teaching a class. He's on the phone with somebody talking about Jesus. Wait a minute. We want Jesus. We want him on Jody. Get him back on Jody. We don't want him on Jesus. I need him sitting. Because I need him to understand. I don't need him to be thinking about me sitting. I want him comfortable. I want him to think he's reached his place like Peter did. That, oh, I know things nobody else knows. He's reached his place. I had a guy I spoke with yesterday that told me he used to be a Christian DJ. Some of you agree, some of you disagree. I don't care if you don't either. But he used to be a Christian DJ. He got so good at it and got his name out there so well that he did a, a concert at Carowinds to 14,000 people. This was his words to me. He said, you know what, Jody? He said, I let my head get so big into it and I let it consume me that I lost it all. He said, I was on my way for God, man. God was putting me in front of crowds I never dreamed I could, but I lost it all. You know what happened? Satan got him sick. He got him comfortable. He said, you've reached it, man. 14,000 people, nobody else can say they've done that in your little circle. You've got it. You're the superior one. And why he was doing it, he was looking for the weak spot. Right there. And he hit him with and when he hit him with it, he was proud, so he fell. And when he fell, we find that Jesus is there. And when I talked to him, he said, listen, he said, I just want to go to church. I need to be fed. I need a relationship with people. I need to get back in a relationship like I need to with Jesus. Pray for me that I can get there. Pray for me that God can bring me back to that place. Because I want to get there, man. I'm messing up. I want to get there. You know what's happened? Jesus has been sitting there this whole time saying, Daddy, you know he loves me deep down in his heart. He, he don't love me like he should, but he loves me. Let's work on him. Let's bring him to where he needs to be. Strengthened by the Savior. Yeah. But let me, let me leave you with this because I feel like some people are here and they're saying, Man, I didn't come to get beat up today, preacher. I come to get encouraged. Let me help you. Because I want you to understand, what did I say at the beginning? Everything has a breaking point. Do you agree? Did you know Satan had a breaking point? See, this was good for me because when I got the sermon together, I was like, okay, God, that's wonderful. I know what not to do. But, but it would be so nice if Satan, I could break him. I want to break him. He said, you can't. I said, show me that. I want that. Because I, I love it. See, he's not expecting that. And so what the Lord did is he took me to scripture and he said, look, Jody, he said, this is what you need to understand. And he took me there. And if you look in James 4 and 7, the Bible says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God and resist the devil. And 
he will break. He will flee from you. He'll break. In other words, he's constantly pushing against me, pushing against me, trying to get me to break. He's trying to find the path of least resistance on me to find a breaking point so that he can break me. But then when he sees I'm standing on the solid rock, amen, and the winds can blow and the rains can fall, but you can't knock this house down, baby, because I am on the rock of Jesus. I didn't build on sand. I'm not built on Jody. I'm built on Jesus, and he is my foundation, and he's blowing and he's pushing and he finally can't push me. I just keep resisting and resisting and resisting. And finally, just like that hurricane, there's going to be some things that it'll destroy. There's going to be other buildings that's amazing to me that'll stand firm. They won't have hardly any damage to them. Why? Because they were built on a more solid foundation. They were built with more sustainable uh, materials. And this morning, I'm telling you that, that when the storm is over, you'll go back and be like, a building destroyed here, a building destroyed here, but the one in the middle is still standing. How did it stand? I'm going to tell you how you're going to stand. Just resist. It resisted everything that the storm had to throw at it. And it said, I will not break in this storm. That's what Job did. He said, I will not break in this storm. I'm settled on Jesus. I'm settled on God. I know my Redeemer lives, and I know I'll stand with him at the last day. Though you slay me, yet will I praise you. He said, I know who I'm on. And you can fight, you can talk, you can run your mouth, you can send everybody around me you want, but I will not, for the Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm going to stand on what I no. And we find that if we do that and we resist the devil, there comes a point in time where he says, oh, I'm getting weak. I'm getting tired. I can't keep pushing. What is this? I don't understand. The hedge has been dropped. I have all opportunity to fight him. I just can't kill him. But he's still fighting back. I don't get it. They said Job looked at him in the past tense, and I believe this is what he said. Satan, you must realize, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I'm more than a conqueror through Christ who strengthens me. You come at me all day long. But you see, I'm not looking at the external. I'm looking at the internal. And I realize this is me and you. Not me and them, just me and you, old boy. And I'm fighting with what I know to fight with. The weapons of my warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God through the pulling down of strongholds. No weapon you've got formed against me can prosper. Revelation 12, 11 said it like this. They, us, overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb. Yes. And by the word yes, sir. of their testimony. Yes. Yep. This morning, Satan would love nothing else. You wonder why you're going through all the stuff you're going through. Why everybody's fighting you so hard. Why everything seems to be falling apart at the seams. Could it be? Could it be? Mm. If you evaluate your life this morning, you find yourself sitting and not serving Jesus. That's strike number one. You don't even realize who the battle's against. It's not family, it's not people, it's Satan. Strike number two. He's dying to sift you. He's looking for the weak points. He's tossing you up to see where you fall, to see what gets you. When he finds the weak points, he begins chipping and punching away at your weak points. And then we find that He's looking for just a little bit of pride in you. He's looking for the places in your life where you say, I will, I will, I will, I will. I can't, I can't. I'm going to, I'm going to. And it's got nothing to do with God. God is out of the equation. It's everything about you and you have pride. And he says, I know what that looks like. Now I've got a weak point. The next thing you know, you find yourself being attacked by the least likely place you ever dreamed you'd be attacked. That was the last person you thought would have hurt you. That's the last person you thought would have called you over before and called you out. That's the last scenario you thought would happen. And now it's happened. You see, if it's all about you, you'll break. But if you're relying on Jesus, he knew it was coming, just like Peter. He's already given you intuition. He says, look, get ready because it's coming. The storm is coming. The breaking point is coming. Brace yourself. Resist. Don't give in. As you resist, I've seen it. That temptation, that, that thing that does so easily besets you and knocks you off your feet. If you learn to stand against it and just push back and say, I will not be moved. 
I'm like a tree. He used to sing that. I'm like a tree planted by the waters. I will not be moved. My roots run deep in God. You can't be deep. Satan realizes, man, I'm tired. I'm just leaving. It's greater is what's in you than what I've done. This morning, I want you to know God sent this word because somebody in here this morning is at their breaking point. Somebody is going to reach their breaking point. And God said, I don't want you going off. I don't want you staffing. I don't want you trying to kill people. I don't want you... I don't want you going off on your family. I don't want you losing your family because of some idiotic thing you do. I don't want you to. I don't want you to go out here and, and walk away from the church and walk away from Christ and walk away from the faith because of you don't understand what you're doing. I want you to be able to stand firm against the attack of the enemy. Caleb, will you come play something for me, brother? This morning. This was really the message I planned to preach last week, and for whatever reason, God didn't let me. I, I'm not going to try to pretend to know because I looked around this morning and I said, hmm, there may be somebody that needed to hear this that isn't here today. I don't know, but I've got to believe God knows what he's doing. Now, don't take me wrong, the devil could have called somebody to have a reason to sit this morning instead of being here. But either way it goes this morning, I believe that there's somebody here that needs this today. Because I believe a lot of things in life are fighting against you. And Satan's distracting you because you're looking at this person and that person and this circumstance and that situation and, 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 and all these things. And you're feeling like you're getting weak and you're going to crumble and you're going to break. And I tell you the best thing you could do this morning is to find a low place and humble yourself and say, Lord, I can't. you can. And I've been trying to fight this battle and I can't fight it anymore. I need you to fight for me. I need you to give me strength. I need you to give me wisdom. Lord, I need you to, to help me stand firm. Help me to start serving. Find me a place, God, where I can serve. Find me help. Give me up off my seat. Help me to realize who the real enemy is. You know, Lord, help me to help me to understand that even while I've been disobedient and I've been lazy, help me to realize that you've been praying for me. And that even right now, in this very moment in time, you're whispering in the Father's ear. You're calling me my name. You got God's eyes right on me. Because the Bible says that not even a sparrow falls from the sky that God doesn't notice. How much more will he notice those that are his? This morning he's seen me fall because of my pride and because of my selfishness, because of my supposing I'm something that I'm not. Satan's fighting me. His hands are bowed and eyes are closed and you're hearing me. Maybe you say, Pastor, I believe this message was for me. I'm in a battle and I'm being broken. And I don't want to break under the power of Satan. If I break, I want it to be a me, me humbling myself so that he doesn't have a point to break me at. Nobody's looking at me and God. And this morning you hear him say, Pastor, you're talking to me. And I just want you to pray with me. I know Jesus is praying for me. But I know the Bible says that we're two agree on earth that we've done anything. Would you be honest enough to raise your hand and say, preach the message at home this morning? I see those hands. I see those hands. Anybody else? Anybody else? Raise that hand and say, preacher, I feel like I'm at a breaking point. Would you pray for me? My family's going crazy, preacher. I need you to pray. I see those hands. My job's going crazy, preacher. I need you to pray. I see those hands. Preacher, my health is going crazy. I need you to pray. Satan's attacking me. Preacher, my my finances are in ruin. I need you to pray. My faith is on the edge. I need you to pray for anybody else. This morning, you put your hands down. Maybe you hear you say, Pastor, you know what? I've reached my breaking point, but the scary thing for me is I don't have Jesus in my life, and so I have nothing to lean on. 
Preacher, I know that I've done wrong. I know I'm a sinner. I know that Jesus is everything the Bible said he is. He was born of a virgin. He died on the cross for my sins. He was God in the flesh. I believe that he rose again on the third day. He sits in the heaven right now with God. On my behalf, he's trying to pray for me this morning. I believe that, preacher. The preacher, I've never accepted and I've never received it as my own. And this battle's getting hard and I'm tired and I'm weak. And I want to know I've got Jesus on my side. Nobody's looking. I promise we're being respectful. And I really want to pray for you this morning. So would you be honest enough with me to raise your hand and say, Preacher, I'm not sure I would spend eternity with Jesus. I'm not sure I've ever repented of my sins and been saved. But I want you to pray for me. Would you raise your hand? I promise I won't embarrass you. I won't come to you. I'm not asking you to do anything. We're just looking to pray for you. Would there be anybody here like that this morning? Preacher, I'm not sure. As we stand to our feet this morning and as Caleb plays, I want to invite you to humble yourself before the Lord. I want to invite you to come and get in a posture of humility in this altar and say, God, I need you, Lord. I realize that I'm in a fight. fight it about me. I know Satan's trying to destroy me. He's trying to he's trying to take me out. I know where I'm weakest and he's hitting those spots. He's trying to make me mad at you. He's trying to pull me away from you. But this morning, God, I just want to come and kneel and say, Lord, I surrender it all to you. I need you this morning, Lord. I need you. I'm surrendering my life to you right now. I'm surrendering my fight to you right now. If you raised your hand, why don't you come in and ask God for help this morning? Maybe you say, Pastor, I'm doing good right now. There's nothing really going on. I'm not struggling with anything. And this morning, you say, But I know that there's coming a day when I'm going to be in a fight. And I know Satan's coming after me. I'm trying to serve the Lord. I'm, I'm trying to make decisions that are making Jesus happy. And I know he doesn't like it. So I know he's coming. Sometimes it's good just to pray before you ever get in the fight. And say, Lord, prepare me for what's coming. That's what he was trying to do for Peter. Just so get him ready for what was coming. Just hours away from what was coming. This morning, if you need this all, why don't you come and get what you need from Jesus this morning? I can assure you one thing. If you're living for God, Satan's after you to break you. This morning, it doesn't have to be that way. He doesn't have to win. The Bible says, as a matter of fact, he's lost if we fight the right fight.
Father, we come to you this morning. God, we're grateful and we're thankful for the word of God. The examples of those lives that we read about. This morning, may we learn from you, from his mistakes. But God, we wouldn't have to repeat those same mistakes, but God, we can learn from them. Help us to be cognizant of the fact that Satan is on the attack. He wants to destroy us. God, help us to stand firm against this fight, against the weapons of this warfare. Raise up the shield against the fiery darts of the wicked. God, let us use the word of God as our example and our platform. Jesus is our foundation to stand on. God, we will not be overcome, but we need to be overcomers. We'll do that not of our own power, but by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony, that we are our children of God. Father, today I pray for every person that's going through a struggle that's at their breaking point. That feels the wind and the waves and the crushing and the thrashing floor. God, I pray that they would be able to stand firm in you. As we resist the devil, he would break himself. And he would run away. Run away scared of the power that's in us. As our ushers come forward this morning, I ask you to give as the Lord has given to you. Not because you have to, but because you get to this morning. This morning, I want you just to give out of your heart. Sometimes serving means giving. That's the way we serve the Lord, enable other people to serve the Lord through the ministries we have here. So. Transformation Church is a blessing to you, and if the message was a blessing, and even if it's not, if Jesus is a blessing, why don't you give this morning? Why don't you give this morning? God requires 10%. Well, give your best gift this morning. And watch what God will do. Father, bless this offering, bless the gift and the giver. You make us good stewards of your finances and pour out your blessings on every person this morning that is here in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you can't give in cash, go ahead, guys. If you can't give in cash, there's an app called Givelify. And if you're watching online, you can go on that app. You can go to our website and use PayPal. There's many ways to give because I don't want you to miss your blessing this morning. So you give this morning. Amen. This morning, over some announcements real quick. I've got two cards here. Thank you, Dave. I've got two cards here that says... Um, the love and care that was shown to our clients by those members at Transformation Church that helped with the baby shower was a beautiful representation of Christ's love for us. Thank you so much, 1 John 4, 9 through 11, Robin Engel. And then there's uh, several things written inside of another card from those people. It says, thank you for all the gifts. The food was good. I had fun. Uh, from, uh, I believe that's Aisha, Alicia. Um, thank you for the gifts, Brittany. Thank you for all the great advice, Marquise. Thank you. I really enjoy and appreciate everything, Adrena. And thank you for everything the church did for us. I appreciate everything, Sophia. And um, we appreciate everything. So they sent those cards, and I wanted to read that to you so you could have that information. Um, you may be here, you may be saying, why do you even exist here, Pastor? What is the purpose of you being here, uh, this church being here? Number one, that you can know God. Number two, that you can find freedom in that relationship with Christ. Number three, that you can discover your purpose. And number four, that you can make a difference. <laughs> we have a Going Deeper class Wednesday night at 630. Uh, we're beginning chapter one of James. The introduction is over. We hope that you'll join us. It's going to help us to know how to be mature Christians. Not just people that know about Jesus and say we love Jesus, but people that are living mature Christian, obedient lives to Christ and, and representing that in our lives. So we hope you can come be a part of that in the education building at 6.30. Praise theme practice is today at 2 o'clock. Um, I know Shelly had talked about doing the play practice today at 2, so you, if you've got kids that are part of the children's ministry, they're getting ready for the Christmas play, so you can see her if you need more details on that for sure. You, for our teenagers 13 to 19, if you have any kids in that realm, we would love for them to join us next Sunday at 6 o'clock uh, here at the church, excuse me, for our youth meeting. Um, if anyone is interested in sound and media ministry or parking lot ministry, now is the time. We're making some changes. 
in our sound stuff because of the lightning strike. And so um, now's the time to get in and get trained on the new board and all that as we get it. And parking lot ministry, now's the time where you're starting to run out of space, which is a fantastic problem. And uh, we just need people to help us get everybody in and out safely during the week. So if you're interested in either of those, please let me know. Baptism sign up. Baptism sign up is um, if you're here and you've been saved, but you've never been baptized by immersion. We have a couple like that, and then we've had some covenant partners come in that way. Please sign up on the sign-up sheet before you leave today. I'm going to be scheduling the baptism very soon, and we want to get you in on that. So please do that. That's a way to uh, follow through with your relationship with Christ and to symbolize the covenant relationship you have with Jesus Christ. So we want you to get in on that. Um, Sign up for cleaning is back on the table. Uh, I'll be honest, I did it the last two weeks. Somebody else take this week, all right? So uh, somebody somebody can sign up, that would be fantastic. And we'd love to have your help with that. And if this week is already taken, sign up on a week down below. There's enough people here we shouldn't have to clean, but like once every three or four months, if we don't take a turn. And it's a way we can make the church beautiful and, and make people want to feel like they want to come here. Um, so help us with that if you're a covenant partner. Um, Dixie has been having garage sales all through the summer. She is finished. She's done. She's tired. She's through. Um, but she's going to have one more this Saturday, and everything is free. So it's not even garage sales. So garage giveaway, except the garage is going to stay, all right? Yeah, stuff in the garage can go. If you're interested, see Dixie. Dixie, raise your hand. She can tell you where she lives, some of the stuff you may be looking for that she has or does not have. So see her. Uh, last thing on announcements, and I've got one more thing, is that um, Thrive Table, if anybody's interested in the conference, we are having here for ladies in October. It's coming up quickly. Uh, Christina's going to stand over there this morning. A few ladies have not registered. Please register. I hate for you to miss this. Deborah Ross is a phenomenal speaker. It's going to be a great time in the Lord, and you have the opportunity to be in on it and uh, let all the guests that are coming, from what I've been told, Virginia and and the East Coast and everywhere else, you get to be hospitable to them and show them the love of Transformation Church that day, as well as be here and get fed as well. So it's a great opportunity. So see Christina, you can register, you can either pay your money now or pay your money later, but please see her today for that, amen? And even if you're a guy, you wanna help with the event, there's a fundraiser, she can tell you all the information over there, amen? Before we leave today, I wanna to thank the Lord for those who came last week and wanted to become covenant partners with Transformation Church. Amen. Amen. What a wonderful thing that was. And we have more of them this morning. So if you're here and you want to become a covenant partner, come on up. Come on up this morning. If you've made me aware of that. We are so thankful that God is blessing and sending people here. And uh, I spoke to these people and they Everybody in the park has been through the growth track, and he's going to go through the next one. And, um, and so they've been through that, and he's coming as a candidate to be a covenant partner as soon as he's done with that class. And, um, and so we're excited, amen, about what God is doing here and what he's going to continue to do here. And um, we're just thankful to have him. So I want you to just be sure before you leave this morning that you go by. And actually, Jeremy and Jessica, her son's involved too. He's just with his dad this weekend. So, uh, so we're thankful to have him as well, Chase. And so um, come by and let these folks know, Doug and Robin and Mark and Jeremy and Jessica and George. Let them know we're so thankful to have them this morning. Amen. And we're just excited that God is moving and guiding people to want to be part of our family here. And so I'm going to do the same thing I did last week, and we're going to close up and pray. Um, if you're here this morning, and you say, well, preacher, I feel like this is where God wants me. I feel at home here. I feel like this is where God wants me to be and grow. Then you're welcome to come up right now and join me so that you don't have to be so back by yourself possibly another week. But you don't have to, but if God's leading you to, I'm going to give you the opportunity right now to do so. Amen. Father, we thank you for this time together this morning. We thank you for the blessing of your word. We thank you for what you're doing here in our congregation, Lord. We thank you for how you're growing our family each and every week. And God, we pray you do so not only by people coming to be covenant partners, but God, also when people coming to know Christ and becoming part of that true family of God. Father, we pray this morning that as we go forward and you would be with us this week, that you would bless our week, that you would continue to draw people to this place because God, I know the heart you've given me and it's a heart to change this world for the cause of Christ, Lord. And I pray that you'd help us to get on that and we can go forward and see you do amazing things. 
God, we praise you for the miracles we see in this place today. And God, the miracles that we know is coming in the door next week. And God, we love you. Help us to adhere to your word this morning. We praise you and we give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. One last thing before we leave. Billy, stand up. I want to thank God for how he's healing Billy of cancer. Amen. It's good to have you back from the hospital this morning. And uh, we go on Tuesday to get some tests running and stuff. But the doctors are saying right now that he's pretty much a raw cancer free. So let's give God a hand. Leave this morning, come on, shake your shaking stokes hands, let them know we're happy to have them, and y'all have a great day.